Hi everyone, my name is Anna, and today I want to talk about a few of my favorite things. Kinder Eggs! I decided to look into the history of Kinder Eggs, and Kinder Surprise specifically, and I ended up so far down a rabbit hole that now I'm coming back up to drag you all down with me. Let's go! These little guys are my favorite candy for two reasons. One is the gimmick, and two, nostalgia. The experience of getting um, this little toy that you could build inside of like a really good chocolate egg was insane as a kid. Just best candy ever, right? Fight about it. Let's start with some background. The Kinder Eggs were actually made by Ferrero in 1974, thanks to Michelle Ferrero and William Salas, and they were inspired by an Italian tradition of giving children gifts in a chocolate egg. Kinder Eggs ran with this concept and included toys like animals, cars, dolls, spinning tops, and puzzles. But let me tell you, the puzzles were the worst possible toy you could get uh, because they were so small, just practically microscopic pieces, and they would take absolutely no time to put together, okay? Like, maybe I wasn't the target audience by then, all right? But I was, I was sick of it. Those are the worst ones. In 1997, Kinder Eggs faced a challenge in the U.S. and were examined and then recalled under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It specifically prohibits food items from containing a non-food object within that food item unless it has a functional value. And that actually makes me wonder if this is just to keep fortune cookies a thing? And that was just the first thing that popped into my mind about a food item that has a non-food item inside of it with functional value, right? I don't know, it's an interesting distinction, I guess. As a kid, I knew of Kinder Eggs, but not that they were recalled. And there were small bakeries and corner stores in New Jersey, where I lived then, uh, that would sell Kinder Eggs. They're totally legal in Canada and Mexico, but just not here in the US. But they were likely imported using foreign labels that passed through like a cursory inspection. But individuals who have attempted to bring Kinder Eggs from Canada or Mexico here have been fined anywhere from $600 to $2,500 per egg. Anyway, the chocolate that they use for a Kinder Egg is the same as their regular Kinder chocolate bars, and it's amazing. It actually has more milk than regular milk chocolate, and it's actually in an attempt to make the chocolate seem healthier right? and for parents to want to buy it for their kids. And the egg itself is really simple. It's just wrapped in foil. It's like a shell with two pieces. You open it up and the yolk is like a yellow capsule that has the toy in it. It might sound like I'm really into Kinder Eggs and it's because I am. I am really into Kinder Eggs. But I can go ahead and tell you that the US version of the Kinder Egg, the Kinder Joy, is not as good. Looks like the I guess it's an egg with two yolks. This is kind of funny to me. I, it's just like so different from the very simple, right, like outer chocolate shell egg. Um, this is kind of like the Ferrero Rocher. I probably, <laughs> I probably did not say that right. Um, yeah, my favorite part would be these guys in the middle. Uh, if you noticed, I was unwilling to bring Kinder Eggs over here from Mexico. And honestly, the regular Kinder chocolate bar is it's enough to satisfy, right? You don't really need the small plastic animal with it. But I think I've firmly established that I'm the kind of person that enjoys a gimmick. Now, let's talk about the Wonder Ball. Wonder Ball was another chocolate that stirred a lot of excitement. Uh, it was similar to a Kinder Egg, but with a twist where Nestle had a hollow chocolate ball filled with candy, like hard candy. Now, it didn't include toys because of those legal restrictions Kinder was already facing, but sometimes it would have stickers like next to outside the ball, and then later on, toys would come in like a separate compartment. Worked out, but the Wonder Ball chocolate was never as good, and they later sold it to a different chocolate company. So this is actually called a surprise and delight strategy. It's specifically employed to create a positive experience for customers where they feel that they're receiving an additional value beyond the primary product. The larger concept is to go an extra step beyond fulfillment. Your customers want to feel that there is something extra they got and that it's a result of the care you put into your actions, like the presentation of your items. If you've ever gotten a handwritten thank you note from Etsy, that's 
very much the same concept, different execution. Handwritten notes, coupons, free upgrades, those are all examples. But the execution of this strategy can have wildly different results. Now, getting a random coupon in your inbox from a store you've shopped at once or twice isn't that new or surprising. And more than likely, it's a coupon enticing you in for 20% off of a purchase that must meet a minimum of $75 first. So that kind of surprise and delight execution feels more opportunistic than delightful. Chewy is a brand that has had a lot of positive interactions with their surprise and delight executions, like how they sent portraits of their customers' pets to them as a thank you, or in the case of some, to send their condolences. This is the kind of above and beyond action that draws a lot of positive attention to the brand, but it can also create some unrealistic expectations for other customers who might see that and then expect the same. This is not me endorsing or promoting the brand Chewy though, because in my research I did find that they're attempting to screw over those same pet portrait artists. Disney's another example of a brand that employs the surprise and delight strategy, but to mixed results. You have Disney super fans, of course, who are surprised and delighted frequently, but then you have people who may go out of their way to visit every once a year or once every few years who could be called back more often if they have a meaningful interaction with the brand. A birthday message or meet and greet with a Disney character, for example. Past Disney Park cast members have described an ability to create a magical moment with customers where they could give someone a no-strings-attached card to redeem for either a free food item, a free fast pass, or a free merchandise item. And of course, once that got around to people, um, they started outright asking cast members for this card slash magical moment. But in the end, a surprise and delight strategy is truly about designing a customer's experience. People won't always remember the things that you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. The fact that there are people who fully understand that the chocolate in the Kinder Egg is exactly the same as in the regular chocolate bar that it is actually sold in the US, but still brought Kinder Eggs back from Canada to bring here speaks to how good the candy is and how good the strategy is. The whole thing. Someone in Seattle tried importing a box with six eggs and got caught at the border. And I don't know if they fined him the full amount, but they threatened him with a $2,500 fine per egg. So $15,000 total for bringing Kinder Eggs into the US. Oh my God, oh, this poor guy. I don't know if he actually got fined that much, but. According to CBC News, the Seattle dudes were not fined $15,000 and after two hours, they were just let off with a warning. When Ferrero launched Kinder Joy in the US in 2018, its sales were over $100 million in the first year alone. There was this idea that the Kinder Joys would resolve the issue of people smuggling Kinder Surprise into the US. But if these Quora posts are anything to go by, people are definitely still considering it. These Quora responses are all post-introduction of the Kinder Joy. I found this change.org petition to free the egg by making it legal in the US, and it still has not reached its goal of 10,000 signers, so not a ton of signers, but there is a ton of heat in these comments. It looks like there is still a small but vocal community of people that dislike the changes that are present in the Kinder Joy enough that they will still seek out the Kinder Surprise, either by trying to mail it, uh, separating the toy from the chocolate before crossing with it, or just playing it cool. Now, the sad part about most chocolate, but also most consumer goods, is that the global supply chain involved has many, many violations of human rights, labor rights, and health standards. There is an argument to be made that wanting the raw materials at the cheapest price possible is the biggest factor here in terms of Ferrero and a lack of ethical sourcing. Ferrero has made several public statements about their commitment to ethically source their chocolate, palm oil, and hazelnuts, all extremely exploited industries, but we all know that this could be a PR effort more than anything. I will say that points go in their favor because of the third-party certifications that they have in regards to their efforts. But when it came to the source of the Kinder Egg toys, I came across an investigation by The Sun, a UK newspaper, that revealed that the subcontractor in Romania who deals with the fulfillment of those toy orders for Kinder Eggs use child labor and pay miserable wages about $16 a day, or $4.63 per 1,000 eggs assembled. 
I have to say that I don't trust the sun alone as a reliable source. So I kept looking for other sources that could independently verify this story, the investigation, and I saw that Reuters, a credible source that I do trust, wrote about this and did find that both Ferrero and Romanian prosecutors would be looking into the allegations. Because of the nature of the industry Ferrero is in, it's easy to assume that these allegations must be true. But hold on. One of the women pictured in the Sun article, Timea Jurge, told her local news that the photos she took with her children assembling the toys together were staged by the journalists. They'd offered her husband a job in the UK in exchange for taking those photos. The British press, having sensationalized stories about Romanian people and Romania specifically, is nothing new. And there have been two in the past 10 years alone that were proven false after the people in the article came forward saying that they were paid to lie. Besides the people in the Sun article, I couldn't find more claims or even more information about the use of child labor in the supply chain of Kinder's toys. What stands out to me is that the only part of this story that's getting more scrutiny, or at least the most scrutiny, is the child labor aspect. Meanwhile, the wage of about $16 a day is still true. The same year that this was revealed, Ferrero ended their relationship with the subcontractors in question. The Satu Mer Territorial Labor Inspectorate's investigation into claims of child labor found that the people who were named in the Sun article were not employees of either subtractors that were assembling Kinder toys. This could mean that these people were hired under the table or illegally, but the Labor Inspectorate has not given further information publicly, so all we know is that there isn't enough evidence to move forward with a criminal investigation. Neither the Ferrero site nor the Kinder site have a statement on ethical sourcing of the toys in the Kinder eggs, but they do have statements on their raw materials. Ferrero UK states in their Modern Slavery Report from 2021 that they're committed to fair wages and working conditions with no child labor, and that their suppliers are subjected to this code as well. This is a great example of why verifying a story with multiple sources, outlets, is really important, especially because it took me a few searches before I found the update to the investigation and follow-up articles. Now, I'm not here to bum anybody out, and in fact, I think the missing factor in a lot of these discussions is hope for the future. There are more options today, more access to information. There is ethical chocolate out there. In fact, the organization Slave Free Chocolate is dedicated to being a resource for finding ethical chocolate companies. Their statement here about the issue and their goal really sums it up for me. There's also the matter of ethical products being more expensive than big brands due to the nature of their small batch manufacturing and, of course, their sourcing. It isn't going to be cheap on the consumer end to pay for alternatives to these well-known brands. Not everyone is going to be able to make the switch. For those who can and want to, I'll link resources for alternatives in the description. I am hopeful for a future where we can make more demands of these companies and enact real change. Wow, that was a bit of a long ride. On another note, I also came across this article about how eclectic and mysterious Michelle Ferrero is, so... The specter of Willy Wonka is always looming. I've seen some different versions of these um, worldwide, so... I know the allure of buying candy that has like a special surprise inside is definitely widespread. So I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. I also had a different one the other day and I got this like a little monster dude wearing a hat of another monster. And I think he's supposed to also be like a crayon. Um,